So we're very excited about our next reader, Lisa Simeone. Lisa has hosted Weekend All Things Considered, Weekend Edition Sunday, Performance Today, World of Opera, Sound Print, and countless live specials. I would say she's probably one of the best known voices in Baltimore radio. <coughs> Uh, Lisa is also a writer and has written for Style Magazine, for Urbanite and City Paper, and for several years wrote book reviews and op-eds for the Baltimore Sun. She also writes for and edits the watchdog site TSA News. She's a 1980 graduate of St. John's College in Annapolis and received her MA from the writing seminars at Johns Hopkins in 1997. And Lisa lives in Charles Village. Please welcome Lisa. I'm gonna um, I'm gonna see if I can do this without the mic because I tend to gesticulate a lot and I'm afraid I might bang into the mic or at least I'll move it to the side. You know, let's see if it'll work. Okay, if I stand here, can you all hear me? I tend to have a loud mouth, but if you can't hear me, do you want me to use the mic? I can use the mic. Can you hear me? Yeah. Is this all right? Okay. Although the light here is not all right. I didn't bring reading glasses because I thought the light. Do you want How about the, No, because then I won't. Here, let's do like this. Okay. I've been working in public radio, local and national, for over 30 years. I've done music, news, interviews, call-in shows, live broadcasts, reporting, you name it. At age 55, I'm at the top of my game. Yet don't be surprised if, in a few years, you find me waiting tables. This is the story of how I was blacklisted for my political activities, specifically my involvement in the Occupy movement. A while back, I realized I had to do something besides sign petitions, donate to worthy causes, and send sarcastic emails to everybody on my mailing list. The country was going to hell. Not that it hadn't been for a while, but it was getting worse. Obama, for whom I had voted and over whose victory I had wept in relief on election night, was a disaster. He is not only continuing, but expanding the worst abuses of the Bush administration. Our civil liberties are going down the toilet, we're in a state of permanent war from which both the government and corporations are profiting, and it doesn't matter who gets elected in our corrupt two-party system. The president and most of our so-called representatives dance to the tune that the corporate elite play. So in 2010, I reached out to two longtime Baltimore activists, Kevin Zies and Margaret Flowers. Kevin is a lawyer, he'd run for the U.S. Senate as a Green Party candidate, He'd worked with Ralph Nader. He's a lifelong advocate for drug policy reform. Margaret is a physician who left private practice to work full time on single payer because she was so disgusted by the healthcare mm -hmm. system in this country. I had never met either of them, but we agreed to have dinner and talk. An anti-war protest at the White House was coming up, they said, also at Quantico, where Bradley Manning was being held. Was I willing to risk arrest? Eww. That made me nervous. I know what prisons are. I've done some volunteer work in prisons. Anyone who says they're a country club is a moron. I was afraid of getting arrested. Lisa, it won't be like that, they said. You're not going to be put in with a general population, although that does sometimes happen with cops who hate peace activists. You'll be let go after, at most, a few hours in handcuffs. By the end of dinner, I had agreed to risk arrest. By the way, let me insert here that I have been politically active all my life. Except for risking arrest, this was nothing new, something many of my colleagues have always known about me and have, in fact, witnessed firsthand. Remember that for later. So on March 20th, 2011, I was arrested at the White House. The next day, March 21st, I participated in the protest at Quantico, where there were so many riot gear and camo-clad police with assault rifles that it was staggering, all for a peaceful protest of about 400 people. All this time, I continued my work as host of three different nationally syndicated radio programs, the documentary series Sound Print, the Chicago Symphony Orchestra series, and NPR World of Opera. None of those shows were produced by NPR. I repeat, none of those shows were produced or paid for by NPR. Sound Print produces Sound Print. WDAV in North Carolina produces World of Opera. The Chicago Symphony produces the Chicago Symphony series. Okay, so I continued my work. For sound print, I was expected, nay urged, to put myself in the leads or introductions I wrote for the various documentaries, which covered every subject under the sun, from the most serious to the most frivolous. In fact, if I didn't put myself in a lead, Moira, the executive producer, would send it back to me for a rewrite. 
I was expected to include my personal, philosophical, and yes, political viewpoint in everything I wrote, as anyone can hear from the hundreds of shows I did. I had also only recently stopped writing op-eds and book reviews for the Baltimore Sun because they stopped paying freelancers. They expect you to write for free, since apparently it's such a big whoop to see your name in print. No thanks. <laughs> Bottom line, my political writing at The Sun and at a group blog to which I contributed for years and which dozens of NPR and sound print people knew about was never a cause for concern. Fast forward to the Occupy movement. I was part of the steering committee for an occupation of Freedom Plaza in Washington, D.C. that was planned way before there was an Occupy movement, before OWS, Occupy Wall Street. So when OWS took place, we were thrilled. We thought, you know, we're, we've hit the zeitgeist, we're with it. Our occupation began on October 6, 2011. I wrote press releases, handled media calls, did interviews, and in general helped coordinate stuff. I also marched and chanted. On the night of October 19th, another Occupy activist and I were guests on a call-in show at WPFW in Washington. Just before I went on the air, I got a phone call from Moira, the executive producer of Soundprint. She started asking me all these questions. Did I know so-and-so? Had I seen thus and such? Did I know the Daily Caller? No, no, and no. After a long roundabout conversation, it became apparent that she was talking about my involvement with Occupy. And she said, I think you violated NPR's code of oh. ethics. How, I asked. Well, you can't be involved in any political activity or anything partisan, quote, partisan. I then detailed some of the political activity I'd been involved in all my life, including some she'd witnessed. I added that I despised both political parties equally, so how could I be partisan? <laughs> and I brought up another point, the most important point in my view of this whole kerfuffle. Why is it, I said, that Scott Simon can write pro-war op-eds and make pro-war speeches, yet still host his show? Why can Mara Liason flack for Fox TV, yet remain an NPR reporter? Why can Cokie Roberts collect tens of thousands of dollars a pop in speaking fees from corporations she then reports on? Why are none of these people in violation of NPR's code of ethics? Moira's response, I don't know, but you can't do it. Finally, after more runaround, I said, wait a minute, are you firing me? I have to, she cried. No, you don't have to, Moira, I said. You're choosing to. This isn't NPR's decision because you're not an NPR show. This is your decision. She agreed. Shortly after, I hung up the phone. A few minutes later, I went on the air at WPFW and talked about the Occupy movement, not about my firing. When I got home that night, my voicemail and inbox were flooded with messages from reporters. I didn't know what the hell was going on. There's no way anyone could have known about my private phone conversation. I soon discovered that NPR had issued an all-staff communications alert about my activities, saying, quote, we of course take this issue very seriously. They also sent out a press release. I decided that it was inevitable that this story was going to get away from me and that people were going to repeat all kinds of uninformed bullshit. So I had to make a statement and I wanted to make it in writing so that no one could misquote me, paraphrase what I said, change it, or in general, fuck it up. I also knew that if, I didn't, that if I didn't bring up the subject of other reporters' conflicts of interest, nobody else would. This is what I wrote originally in two emails, one to media reporter Dave Folkenflik of NPR and one to David Zurowick of the Baltimore Sun in its entirety. I find it puzzling that NPR objects to my exercising my rights as an American citizen, the right to free speech, the right to peaceable assembly on my own time in my own life. I'm not an NPR employee. I'm a freelancer. NPR doesn't pay me. I'm also not a news reporter. I don't cover politics. I've never brought a whiff of my political activities into the work I've done for NPR World of Opera. What is NPR afraid I'll do? Insert a seditious comment into a synopsis of Madame Butterfly? <laughs> <laughs> this sudden concern with my political activities is also surprising in light of the fact that Mara Liason reports on politics for NPR yet appears as a commentator on Fox TV. Scott Simon hosts an NPR news show, yet writes political op-eds for national newspapers. Cokie Roberts reports on politics for NPR, yet, yet accepts large speaking fees from businesses. Does NPR also send out communications alerts about their activities? 
This statement was reprinted, not always in its entirety, all over the blabosphere, all over newspapers, even abroad. News outlets in Switzerland, Russia, Canada, the UK all picked up the story. Opera host has political opinions. Stop the presses. <laughs> NPR, NPR tried to strong arm WDAV into getting rid of me. WDAV didn't. I was told that this decision went up to the highest levels of Davidson College, which holds WDAV's license, and that since Davidson takes seriously its adherence to academic freedom, they were not about to can the host of a music show that had nothing to do with politics, nor were they about to be pushed around by NPR. So NPR did the next best thing. It told WDAV it had to change the name of the program from NPR World of Opera to World of Opera. Same show, same producer, same host, same audience, same everything. It just wouldn't have the imprimatur of NPR. And in a move reminiscent of Stalinist Russia, NPR purged my voice from any existing NPR shows. <laughs> Christmas specials, Hanukkah specials, that kind of thing. You know, shows that just get repeated every year where you'd hear me doing only the most minor interstitial stuff. Welcome to blah, 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 I'm Lisa Simeone, now here's Jonathan Winters, you know, whatever, doing a Christmas carol. They removed my voice and had somebody else redo the narration. <laughs> Oh, and by the way, nobody bothered calling the Chicago Symphony to ask if they too were going to can me or Style Magazine, where I still write and which seems unperturbed by my political activities. Okay, so I was fired by Soundprint. I was not fired by NPR because they couldn't fire me because I wasn't an NPR employee, but they wanted the people to think that they could and they were. In the public statements they issued, which you can still see on the NPR website, the lunacy goes from simply overblown to downright hilarious. NPR backpedaled like crazy. After first stating that they, quote, take this issue very seriously, they resorted to cribbing lines from my public statements. In other words, she doesn't even work for us. We've got nothing to do with her. We're just making a big deal out of this because we can, because we want to show that we aren't <coughs> gasp liberal. Newsflash, anyone who still thinks NPR is liberal either isn't listening or is stuck in the past. Yes, 40 years ago NPR was liberal, even 35 years ago, but they haven't been since. If anything, they are corporate, middle of the road, don't rock the boat. But as Machiavelli observed, people base their beliefs not on reality but on reputation. Therefore, the right and the left continue to base their opinions on NPR's reputation not its reality. So, why did all this happen? Here's my theory. I was payback for Juan Williams. Because NPR botched his firing and took well-deserved flack for it, they had to pretend they were firing me. They used me to score cheap political points. Since Juan Williams was considered right-wing and they got rid of him, they had to get rid of somebody who, although she didn't even work for them, was left-wing. If NPR and Soundprint had simply ignored it, this story would have blown over in 24 hours. Nobody would have given a shit. I'm not a big name. I'm not Juan Williams. I'm not Bob Edwards. Another personnel decision NPR botched. But no, instead they made a big deal out of it and made sure everybody in the world knew about their much vaunted ethics. Speaking of ethics, it was interesting to see who in the world of journalism defended me and who lectured me on my ethical lapse. David Zerowick of The Sun took NPR's side and to this day refuses to acknowledge the conflicts of interest I pointed out and that NPR reporters still have. James Fallows of The Atlantic, about as upright a journalist as you'll ever find, who in fact wrote an entire book on journalistic ethics, took my side. Huffington Post backed me up, so did Salon, so did The Guardian. There was also plenty of humor. James Ponowazek of Time Magazine and Eric Wemple of the Washington Post wrote hilarious spoofs of purported partisan broadcasts. <laughs> Public radio <laughs> listeners, have you long worried that your station was undermining capitalism through its broadcasts of the ring cycle? <laughs> <laughs> Tired of having your children brainwashed by the socialistic messages of La Traviata? <laughs> but I still lost almost half my income, and it ain't coming back. So here we are, 10 months after my little comic opera, and what do we have? Garrison Keillor holds fundraisers for Obama. Tavis Smiley and Cornell West openly advocate political positions on their public radio shows. 
Not only has Fareed Zakaria copped to plagiarism, but he gets as much as $75,000 per speaking engagement from corporations. He's been slapped on the wrist for the plagiarism, but he won't lose his jobs. And he won't be scraping by on the pittance that unethical people like me make. And finally, Adam Davidson, host of NPR's Planet Money, is also accepting payments from the corporations he purports to cover. And nobody bats an eye. Has NPR issued a communications alert about Adam Davidson's activities? Of course not, because it's okay if you tow the corporate line, not okay if you oppose it. I opposed it, and I was made to pay. If I had been covering the Occupy movement as a reporter and also participating in it, then of course I would have been in breach of the code of ethics, of course, but that wasn't what happened. I know I shouldn't be surprised by hypocrisy anymore at my age, yet still I am. The hypocrisy of the media, the hypocrisy of people I worked with for years, sometimes decades, who are now no longer speaking to me since this debacle, the hypocrisy of my journalistic betters who continue to collect six-figure salaries while crapping all over their so-called code of ethics. In the end, I have to quote Orwell, who has taught us so much about the way the world works. All animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. Yeah. <laughs>